There's no doubt that our framework is a breakthrough. If it leads uh, to a piece of legislation, I intend to support it. After decades of mass shootings in America, a breakthrough on Capitol Hill as Congress is on the verge of breaking a 30-year logjam to do more to control our nation's gun violence. We talk with a leading Catholic voice ministering right now to a devastated community. This is a good opportunity for us to renew our commitment to support um, women and families in need in the time especially of an unexpected pregnancy. We travel to one of America's most pro-abortion states to find out what the Catholic Church is doing to support women and show them the path towards life. Even though we discussed this thing about rough, you sleep comfortably in your bed because rough men go to war. Well, the rough men suffer and healing the invisible and spiritual wounds of war. We take you to Lourdes, France on a journey for warriors who need the Lord's help to overcome their pain. EWTN News In Depth starts now. There are people, brothers and sisters, people who need help. We need to help them so that they will not destroy life, human life. An archbishop on the front lines of grief in Uvalde, Texas, after gun violence rips through his community. He says action is needed to stop the loss of lives. Welcome to EWTN News In Depth. There's renewed hope this week that there will be action to help curb gun violence in the United States. Despite thousands of mass shootings across America over the decades, it's been nearly 30 years since Congress has passed lasting federal gun control measures. But calls for something to be done are being heard now on Capitol Hill. Since the mass killings at the Topps grocery store in Buffalo, New York, and the elementary school shooting in Uvalde, a bipartisan group of senators has been meeting to try to hammer out what can get passed in the Senate with an eye on balancing Second Amendment gun rights and common sense gun control measures. At least 60 senators have to agree on legislation to get past any filibuster attempts. Last weekend, the senators announced an agreement in principle, which now must be written into actual legislation. It includes funding to incentivize states to pass red flag laws, allowing juvenile records to be searched during the background checks for buyers under 21, and strengthening the background check system, increasing funding for school security as well. The outline does not include a renewal of the so-called assault weapons ban that expired in 2004, and also does not raise the age to purchase a firearm. The agreement does not go as far as a measure approved just weeks ago in the House, but this compromise might just get through the Senate. For myself, I'm comfortable with the framework, and if the legislation ends up <coughs> reflecting what the framework uh, indicates, I'll be supportive. I think it's progress for the country, and I think the, the, the bipartisan group has done the best they can to get total support and the background check enhancement for that age group, I think is a step in the right direction. I think the reason we're picking up Republican votes right now is because you know, what we include in this bill is wildly popular. The public wants red flag laws, the ability to take guns away from people who are threatening suicide or mass slaughter. They support closing the boyfriend loophole to make sure that all domestic abusers can't then go buy a gun. Um, these are popular mainstream proposals. Some sticking points remain as details of the legislative language are being worked out. But both sides say they hope the new gun measures will be hammered out and then approved by both the Senate and House in time for a presidential signature by the July 4th congressional recess. As we've reported, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops wrote a letter to Congress urging tighter gun control measures. Some of the changes bishops are supporting are a total ban on assault weapons, limitations on civilian access to high-capacity weapons and ammunition magazines, and universal background checks for all gun purchases. A Catholic leader in the very thick of this issue is the Archbishop of San Antonio, Gustavo Garcia Siller. His archdiocese includes the town of Uvalde, Texas, where the elementary school mass shooting took the lives of 19 innocent children and their two teachers just three weeks ago. Archbishop Garcia Siller, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. You're welcome. 
you immediately went into the community right after the shooting, speaking with all those impacted and offering a mass, a special mass, for the victims the next day. What were the days that followed like for you? How did the community come together and how did the church offer support? Uh, well, uh, I was serving mass the very first day of the shooting. And since then, I was there a few days and then I returned for different um, uh, ways of being present to the people. Um, the whole community came together in many different ways. This is a very small town, 15,000 people. People, they know one another. Uh, the pastor of the parish is uh, a priest born and raised in Uvalde. So he knew the names and the families. So it was, in that sense, was easy to connect with, with the people and with the authorities. And of course, we, we hear the stories of the students who were murdered and they were eulogized in the press, but the teachers suffered too. You presided over the funeral of Irma Garcia, a teacher killed in the Uvalde shooting. Her husband died two days later of a tragic heart attack. How did you provide pastoral care to those who loved them? Well, the, the, the care on my part was the presence and, and with gestures. It is very difficult to console, in the case of the children, to console their families. There are no words. They don't know also what to say. Uh, in the case of the teacher and her husband, the same story uh, with a little bit of, of uh, that I w something that I would like to add. In the case of the teacher and her husband, um, they had four children, so I was able to speak with them uh, in, the, in a room. And again, very briefly, my way of helping was just to say, uh, do you have talked to each other uh, about what was has been happening? And they say, mm, no. So when they show me that, I just say, well, what about you, the oldest boy? What do you like to say to your sister? And it was like an hour and a half of dialogue with among them, uh, between themselves. The only thing I did at the end, after an hour and a half, was to say the Our Father, and that was it. And then we joined the 50 other members of the family who were in the house, uh, the extended family. So it has been presence, gestures, love, care, prayers, the celebration of, of Mass every day, especially during that first week. Um, and then uh, visiting also the, we opened two centers for counseling, one led by Catholic Charities and the other by uh, Catholic Schools San Antonio. So the, uh, we have been there every day to provide uh, accompaniment. And I, I went several times to visit those two sites and how, to see how they were doing. And many people went to those uh, two sites to receive help, um, especially the, the the center for for uh, children and family members or teachers was conducted by uh, uh, Catholic schools uh, office here from here from San Antonio um, using this the Catholic school that we have in Uvalde and Catholic charities besides counseling uh, to the wider audience they were providing other services. Uh, during those days, it just happened that I was, it was planned to open a new site in an hour and a half away from Uvalde, uh, uh, run by Catholic Charities. So we were able to expand other services like uh, uh, lawyers, uh, food, clothing, many other way, other ways of providing support to the people yes so um that has been the the, the priest of the deanery 
there, there are about 12 priests, all of them and the permanent deacons had been on the site taking turns about also listening to people and their stories and just being there uh, like we believe Jesus would. This has recently affected Catholic school enrollment for you. Why? What kind of security measures have been put in place since the shooting at Catholic schools? Okay. In our Catholic school, immediately, uh, the pastor and a team from my office began to search how to put in place a better, a better uh, security system for the safety of the, of the, of the children. And... I mean, this situation happened towards the end of of the school year. So we have the summer, and we are going to improve tremendously in not only the, the school, but the parish, too. And you've seen an uptick in enrollment. Yes, that's true, too. Uh, and that, I mean, it's, it's maybe it will be, it's a nor normal thing to, to expect, because all those children who were going to to the school where the shooting took place, they need to find their places. And and also, many of them are because they know our, our ethics and our um, consistent ethics in our Catholic education. Your brother bishops have been very outspoken about the recent shootings around the country. Uh, Bishop Daniel Flores of Brownsville, Texas, took to Twitter right. with some strongly worded comments after the shooting, saying, don't tell me that guns aren't the problem. People are. I'm sick of hearing it. Continuing, and he continued with the sacralized death instruments, um, that they're, they're surprised that death uses them. You live in Texas. There's a very strong gun culture there. Is Bishop Flores' uh, comment a popular opinion, or are you personally and him getting pushback? Well, uh, I think we have been outspoken because we have seen the crisis in our faces. Uh, also, the bishop from um, El Paso, uh, who has experienced the shootings uh, about a year ago, uh, you recall, um, uh, guns are very sacred here in this state. And it's true that people who are with mental illness or people who are just in rage, they can do those things too. But the, the common factor is that it's very easy access to guns. And and our, the call is to put a person first. Always people are more important than guns. And if we do not support the human development of the people that we are serving, why do we expect that they are going to do when they have such an easy access to guns? What does that look like, Archbishop Gustavo, these solutions that are both appropriate and possible for the personal human development? Is what Congress is doing in terms of limiting access to guns enough for you, or is there a bigger picture here that we're missing? Oh, I think we are missing the larger picture. Every step is, is, is a gain, but it is very little, really. Um, they still dia having dialogues about it. Uh, but it's, 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 it's painful to see how there is not a real conviction, you know, that with guns, uh, we are not going to defend each other appropriately, and we are going to, um, with guns, we are, we, we are going to delay the growth of people in what means to develop their minds, their thinking, and their convictions, even their consciences. True human so, flourishing. That's right. This and, is... and then, and then the spiritual, the, the spiritual matter. I mean, the spiritual dimension, because uh, we, when we say that we respect life, and that Texas is, is. Uh, fairly to say Christian, well, let's follow Jesus Christ. 
Well, we will be praying for them, and we're praying for you, Archbishop. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. A very emotional issue, and Archbishop Gustavo is visibly exhausted from providing so much pastoral care to his shattered community. Think of Uvalde. Your prayers are needed. Gun violence gets the most press from mass shootings, but it's also a pressing concern in everyday life on the city streets. Here to discuss is Father Agustino Torres with the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, which is based in the Bronx and dedicated to working within poor inner city communities. Father Agustino, it's so great to have you here. You're no stranger to gun violence. You've seen people shoot others in front of you. What do you think contributes to the growing anger fueling recent shootings? Um, speaking as a priest, I think it's demonic. I think that we need uh, to be purged of some of these things. But uh, at social level, there's there's a desperation. Uh, there's there's a, a, a great need for Christ to return into the hearts of our people, and for that peace to to, to be manifest throughout the world. And this has a lot of different manifestations, and gun violence is one of them. Mm. Discussions around counseling for the victims' families, they're always at the forefront. But what about the general mental health discussion? What is the church saying about that? Uh, the church is, is speaking up on the mental health issues, uh, but the question is, is like, how is this being concretely lived out? It's difficult. The need is, is incredible. Uh, you could say that we're still sick from the pandemic, but now it's a, a mental and a, and a heart uh, sickness. Uh, and we need to uh, rehumanize the world in, 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 in the light of Jesus Christ. And this is hard work. It is hard work, but you're doing it. Father Agustino, what can you tell us? Is there an anecdote that you have of what it's like to do this work and to help people who are struggling both mentally and spiritually? Yeah, it's it's about being there, being present, and taking a risk. Uh, a, a while ago, I was just there in the Bronx, and a knock came to the door at 11 p.m., and a man said, you know, he said, uh, I am going to buy a gun and shoot my family, and there's nothing that you can do that will change my mind. And I was like, whoa, what is going on here? I began to pray internally, and I spoke to him, and it was like a, a chess match for the sake of his life. I spoke, I spoke him down from that, found him a way to get into our shelter, and... Um, and really helped him rehabilitate his life. And this is this is a little bit of what we do. We're there in those moments of, of incredible crisis and talking people out of horrible things, really casting out the evil by, by being present and bringing Christ to the world. Yesterday, we just had a procession through the streets of our neighborhood. These are the things that we are doing in the place where violence is happening witnessing right where it's happening. In your ministry, you're working with gangs in New York and around the country. Are assault weapons the problem, or is gun violence different there? I'm, I'm thinking about the USCCB proposal. Is that actually helpful for you as you minister to those on the streets? That's a great question. I, I'm not an expert. Um, I do know and work with the police a good bit, but mostly what I see, unfortunately, is handguns. You know, me working with the young people, there's a lot of handguns, there's there's death, there's violence, there are shootings. Uh, but I, I personally do not see those assault weapons on our streets, although I do know they exist. And where do those handguns come from? Is that is it something where people who have mental health issues have access to rampant guns, or is this is this gang related, where they're not necessarily within the law to begin with? My experience is that they're not in within the law to begin with. There's a lot of ghost guns on the street. It's it's very it's a very sad reality, but that's my experience. But your work is also obviously Catholic, ministering to those many that are many are scared to approach. This is not an easy thing what you're doing, and uh, many of us would rather look the other way than be there for someone who is mentally hurting. Um, and you've had those scary situations all the time. Can you just explain to us the Catholic perspective on guns and guns control? Is there actually church teaching on this? Uh, explicit church teaching, like this is what you should do with, with possession of guns, no. I mean, we have the, the moral principles that, that undergird all of our teaching. Uh, it is within the purview of a person for self-defense, and so there is a clear argument for possessing a gun for that self-defense, because sometimes that the, the, the lethal force shown, it has to be proportional in our moral teaching. Uh, so there is a—and uh, guns in and of themselves— 
um, are not morally evil vis-a-vis -vis something like abortion, which is just very clear in our moral teaching. Uh, but the question arises, then, what about some of these um, weapons that were meant for, designed for mass carnage? And this is some of the things that are being said currently by our bishops. Um, and uh, the, the words of common sense laws, uh, There's n church teaching would support this very clearly. And, um, and, and I do, too. You know, for somebody who can't buy uh, a beer but can buy an assault weapon, um, the questions arise in my mind. It's like, what, what's behind that? And we need to look at that. I think Archbishop uh, mentioned in, in another time that, that guns have become an idol. I'm from South Texas. I see this. <laughs> we need to be more um, Catholic in this area as well. And in understanding that compassion, really quick, what kind of measures are needed to bring that inner peace um, and, and that peace to vulnerable communities? How can we advocate for people who are at risk and vulnerable to gangs and violence? Prayer is powerful. The, the, the battle is spiritual before anything else. Uh, we invite you to come and participate. Uh, with our work, uh, support our work, um, but to, to be there to, to, to know that Christ is the answer and to live that way is what is needed. Well, we hope that everyone hears your message and we'll be praying for you. Padre, thank you so much. Thank you, Monsi. We will follow the gun legislation as it goes through Congress and have the developments as they happen. EWTN News In Depth will be right back. There are pro-lifers out there throughout the country who will do whatever it takes to help any pregnant mom to allow her to not only give birth, but really to take those next good steps in their lives. Next, the Supreme Court might be on the verge of overturning Roe versus Wade. So we take a look at the Catholic emphasis on supporting mothers and their young children. I can describe this feeling that you have staying on a stage in front of other people and it just like makes me happy. I, I really like it and enjoy doing it. We'll meet a Ukrainian teenager making a new home in America and making music with his new high school classmates. But thoughts of his family back in Ukraine are always with him. I'm learning how to adjust and adapt. And just take one day at a time. And a little later, overcoming the wounds of war. We hear from veterans who seek solace at the Grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes. As the Supreme Court term draws to an end, the wait continues for major decisions from the justices on several cases impacting religion, including the Carson v. Macon case that could further permit federal funding for religious schools, and religious freedom cases involving public prayer on the football field that left a coach without a job, and of course, the closely watched Dobbs abortion case from Mississippi. As we anticipate that decision, which could lead to the overturning of Roe v. Wade, startling new data on abortion in the United States. The Goodmacher Institute reports for the first time in 30 years the long-term decline in abortion has been reversed. The Institute's abortion provider census indicates an 8 percent jump in abortions from 2017 to 2020. Translating that into actual numbers, in 2017, there were more than 860,000 abortions, compared to more than 930,000 abortions in 2020. Analysts say there are multiple factors that might have contributed to this rise, including the expansion of Medicaid coverage of abortion care in some states and some local and national abortion funds. They increased their capacity and helped more people pay for their abortions. In a state that has been very pro-abortion, New York, bishops there are asking the faithful to help them strengthen efforts to protect the unborn. Roselle Regis reports from New York City. The Catholic bishops of New York State send a message to the faithful in one of the most liberal states in the nation. Our pro-life efforts must continue. To all the Catholic faithful, to all of our parishes, um, the, the coming decision from the Supreme Court gives us an opportunity to renew and redouble our efforts. In anticipation of the looming Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization by the U.S. Supreme Court, the bishops issued a statement titled, Toward a Pro-Life Future in the Empire State. The statement takes a look at the state's current policies and envisions a path forward for Catholics. 
New York's eight ordinary bishops, including Bishop Robert Brennan of Brooklyn, acknowledged that even if Roe v. Wade is overturned, existing state laws will allow abortions to continue in New York. The rhetoric of you know, New York and other states being sort of a, a safe haven, if you will, for abortions is, is um, chilling. I'm pretty troubled by the fact that there is still um, there are still going to be many abortions, maybe even more here in New York State. A report from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows that there were 78,587 abortions in the state of New York in 2019, with nearly 9 percent of those listed as out-of-state residents. According to Guttmacher Institute, an organization that keeps tabs on sexual and reproductive rights worldwide, in 2017, there were 252 facilities providing abortion. 113 of those were clinics. New York's Reproductive Health Act of 2019 allows abortions until the moment of birth if a woman's life or health are at risk or if the unborn child is not viable. New York is also one of the few states to require taxpayers to fund abortion through Medicaid. Just last month, Governor Kathy Hochul announced a $35 million investment to support abortion providers in the state, while local lawmakers are working to pass several bills to expand access and increase funding for abortions. New York bishops lament such pro-abortion legislation. The bishops call on officials to work towards policies that would support women and families instead, such as equal access to prenatal care and affordable child care. You can have legislative movement, but more important is a conversion of mind and heart. We stand with you. We can help. The bishops have launched a new pregnancy resource page called Help for Moms, where women can find services available to them. One of the Catholic nonprofit organizations listed is Good Counsel Homes, with homes in South Bronx, Spring Valley, and Staten Island. Good Council Homes right here next to me is not just a shelter for pregnant women in crisis. It's a loving home offering care and compassion to any women in need. House manager Faye Malcolm gave us a tour of the maternity home in the Bronx that has enough room to house 13 mothers and their children. Oh, so tell us about this, Ms. Faye. Yes. This is one of our empty rooms that we have um, prepared for when a mom comes in, that we will just put them in there. We have the bed made, we have our cribs, and our, all of our cribs are always made, and all of our rooms always have a crib to welcome a mom. And I saw something over here. Yes. Can you tell us, what is this? It's one of our welcome baskets. When a mom gets here, we always give them a welcome basket. In addition to providing a haven for mothers and families, Good Counsel Homes offers maternity care before and after birth, parenting and nutrition classes, and even daycare for children. As a Catholic organization, Good Counsel Homes also has a chapel in each house. In this room, in the morning at 10, we all gather here for prayer. I will read the Bible, we will pray for the Good Counsel Homes, mothers and babies. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Case manager Annette Thomas says every client has unique needs. Of those women who seek refuge in good council homes, about 80 percent have experienced domestic violence, and about half had at least one abortion. I have a lot of opportunity to spend talking to the moms, hearing about their history, hearing where they would like to go in life. Some of them feel comfortable enough to share like some of the pain that they have had and how they would need a change, want the change in their life. I'm doing the Lord's work. It's, I believe it's ministry. One of the moms living in this Bronx home is Helen Verriotto, who left Florida in search of a better life for her family, including her one-year-old son named Caden. He's my world, and my pride. I really love him a lot, and if it wasn't for good counsel, I probably wouldn't have him right now. Good counsel gave me hope, and that's what I really needed at the time. I just needed hope, and I needed someone to, like, help me. Founder of Good Counsel Homes, Chris Bell, says since opening its doors in 1985, their organization has helped more than 7,800 homeless women and children. You've seen the children. You've seen the mothers. They really, it's a blessing. Uh, to be here to work with them, to see new life come into the world, 
uh, and to see women who at one moment were so down and depressed uh, really turn their lives around. I, I don't say we do it, you know, it's them and it's God's grace that allows women to be the best they can. In New York City, Russell Rages, EWTN News In Depth. Stay with EWTN News In Depth as we find out what happens next on the legal front on the abortion issue. We have extensive coverage planned for the Supreme Court decisions impacting your state and local communities. Analysis you won't want to miss. And this important update to a story we brought you last week about protection for Supreme Court justices. President Biden signed bipartisan legislation on Thursday evening to enhance that security. Protective details already provide security for justices, but now they can also get around-the-clock protection for their families as well. Threats have increased in the wake of tensions over the court's potential abortion rulings. There have been multiple protests outside of the home of some of the conservative justices, and an armed man was arrested outside of Justice Brett Kavanaugh's home earlier this summer and is charged with attempted assassination of a U.S. judge. Top headlines in the Week in Review are next, inflation and interest rates, an update on Ukraine with the leader of the Ukrainian Catholic Church in America, and continued turmoil for the Southern Baptist Convention. Developments in Ukraine top the week in review. As President Joe Biden announces another $1 billion in military aid to the war-torn country, that's a total of $5.5 billion in assistance since the Russian invasion more than 100 days ago. The administration said it's moving as fast as possible to get critical weapons to the fight, even as the Ukrainians say they need more immediately in order to survive. The situation is grim for Ukraine in the eastern Donbas, where Russians have used relentless shelling to capture most of the region. The remaining Ukrainian defenders in the key city of Severodonetsk are holed up in a chemical plant there, which is under constant missile attacks. Nearby villages have been destroyed as the Russians near total control in the key eastern corridor. One man who escaped said his village simply does not exist anymore. American military leaders estimate at least 20,000 Ukrainian civilians have been killed and admit Russian artillery vastly outnumbers the amount of Ukrainian firepower. The Russians are just doing massed fires without necessarily achieving uh, military effects, shall we say. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, are using much better artillery techniques and they're having pretty good effect uh, on the Russians. The Russians have lost probably somewhere in the tune of 20 to 30 percent of their armored force. That's significant. That's huge. In diplomatic developments, the leaders of four key European nations visited President Zelensky in Kyiv this week, offering their support. The leaders of France, Germany, Romania and Italy vowed to back Ukraine's bid to become an official candidate to join the European Union. The leader of Ukrainian Catholics in the United States, Archbishop Boris Gudziak, is just back from a visit to Ukraine. EWTN News in-depth reporter Mark Irons spoke with him this week about his first-hand observations about the war and how Ukrainians are faring. Archbishop Gudziak, thank you for joining us. We are more than 100 days into this war. Millions of Ukrainians have been displaced and thousands of civilians and soldiers have been killed. Now, you visited the western part of the country in May, visiting wounded soldiers and refugees. What is the spirit like among them more than 100 days into this conflict? Well, you know, war is not romantic. And the fact that there's probably close to 100,000 people that have been killed, including the Russian soldiers, um, there, there's also five times as many people that have been injured. It, uh, uh, and all the refugees, 12 million people uprooted. It, it, you know, there's no romanticizing it. But what is the fundamental uh, observation that I left with is the fact that people are not despondent. They're not giving up. They're saying, we have no choice. We have to continue. And we have to make sure that God's truth wins. Update us on the humanitarian relief efforts there. And is there enough being done to support victims and their families? So what has been done up till now has been stupendous. Uh, the seven, almost seven million people that left the country uh, are in different places now. 3.8 million went to Poland. And now 2 million are there. Some have actually come back because uh, wives and children want to be with closer to their husbands and fathers. 
men between 18 and 60 uh, cannot leave the country because of martial law. And in fact, so many of them are volunteering to defend their families, their towns, their, their, their country. Uh, the humanitarian effort of most of the European countries has been phenomenal. Uh, what people don't realize is that there's 12 million people in Ukraine who are still at home but who cannot survive without humanitarian aid because at least 40 percent of the economy has been knocked out. And the whole logistics and delivery system is, is not normal. So getting food, medicine, uh, other kinds of daily supplies to people is, is of the essence. And I, I estimate that the American Catholic Church is, uh, American Catholics through the church have donated uh, about $100 million from humanitarian aid. That has been very good for now, but the issue is, will it continue? Because the crisis is not getting easier. Right, the right. war and battle right now is his harshest. So let's talk a little bit about that. You are with U.S. Catholic bishops in San Diego right now for their annual meeting. What is your mes message to those bishops? And like you said, U.S. Catholics, what is your message to the church and to Catholics? How can they help Ukrainians in need? Well, the first thing I say uh, to the bishops and I say to all the viewers, thank you. Thank you for your open hearts, for your support. There's three things that people have been doing and they should continue to do. The first is to pray. The Soviet Union fell apart without a war. It was armed to its teeth with nuclear weapons. And uh, all of a sudden, because of moral principle, because of prayer, because of the witness of the martyrs, the system fell apart. 15 countries became independent, falling out of that prison of nations. An evil empire, as Reagan properly called it. Uh, the second thing is to be informed. It's very important to have proper information on what is going on. It's not NATO's threats that led to this invasion. Ukraine, which had given up a nuclear arsenal, which reduced its army from 900,000 to 150,000 with only 10,000 battle-ready troops. Ukraine was not a threat to Russia. Ukraine's democracy, civil society, free press, uh, this is the germ that Russians were afraid, Putin was afraid might come into Russia. It's also important to understand that it's not just Putin. 700 university presidents signed a, a petition, a statement supporting the war. Uh, no Russian Orthodox bishop has clearly stepped out against the war. And only about 1% of the clergy out of 25,293 signed a document uh, you know, against the war. So Russian society, generally speaking, is, uh, is supporting this war. And uh, this needs to be understood. And then the third thing, besides prayer and information and advocacy, the third thing is the humanitarian help. Uh, please, please continue, because uh, it's needed. The Archbishop also told Mark he's heading back to Ukraine later this month and will meet with Ukrainian bishops to better understand their current needs. Mark continues his reporting on Ukraine in a few minutes when he brings us the story of a Ukrainian refugee, a teenager, now attending a Catholic high school in suburban D.C., who last saw his family as they sent him to safety at the Polish border. The Federal Reserve has approved the biggest interest rate increase in almost three decades. This is the third rise since March. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said on Wednesday the rate increase comes as a response to inflation. We at the Fed understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. We're strongly committed to bringing inflation back down, and we're moving expeditiously to do so. In the beginning of the year, the interest rate was effectively zero. The Fed has been slowly increasing the interest rate since this spring. Now, the benchmark interest rate is 1.75 percent, a 0.75 percent increase, making it the steepest increase since 1994. This move will slow the economy and hopefully ease inflation. But these higher borrowing costs mean that we'll have to pay more for things like mortgages, credit cards, car loans, and student debt. If inflation does not subside, the Fed will likely continue to raise rates as needed. Economists say the next spike could come as soon as July. 
John Hinckley Jr. is being freed from court oversight this week after 41 years. Hinckley shot President Ronald Reagan in a failed assassination attempt in 1981. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity. While the acquittal meant no jail time for Hinckley, he spent two decades in a hospital before being allowed to be in the community with some restrictions in 2003. In the 67-year-old's final hearing this week, the judge said Hinckley has passed every test and is no longer a danger to himself or others. Leaders at the Southern Baptist Convention 2022 annual meeting have agreed on reforms to address a massive sex abuse scandal that recently rocked what is America's largest Protestant denomination. An investigation revealed widespread claims of sex abuse by hundreds of clergy and other church workers as well as nearly 20 years of cover-ups by church leaders. Investigators found that survivors who reported abuse were denigrated, ignored, or met with hostility, even though the church kept a secret list of more than 700 offenders. The Southern Baptist Convention will now create a way to track pastors and other workers accused of abuse, as well as launch a task force to oversee further reforms. Coming up, we'll be back with an inspirational story from Lourdes that is beautiful both spiritually and visually. You don't want to miss this. If you work with the military, as I've done for the last 14 years, you'll find that the first group that does not want to be at war is the military because they know what it costs. And the cost to the soul is great. Next, we'll talk to veterans whose spirits are lifted after their extraordinary experiences at one of our church's greatest sites of healing. The wounds of war and conflict can be physical, mental, and spiritual. An annual pilgrimage to Lourdes, France aims to heal those seen and unseen wounds and bring together nations. It's a story we first brought you a few weeks ago, but now we bring you the personal stories of some of the American veterans and service members who attended thanks to the Knights of Columbus. Here's reporter Colin Flynn. You feel alone in the world. You, you really feel that nothing is, is, is real. You, you lose your faith. I have injuries that you can't see. You don't know what a person feels inside. At the Grotto of Our Lady in Lourdes, France, servicemen and women from across the world are standing and praying, praying for healing, and for peace. No other population in the U.S. needs healing, peace, reconciliation than our military wounded, ill, and injured, our military that have seen combat. For the locals who live here in the town of Lourdes in the south of France, for one weekend every May, if they were thinking of having a sleep in, they can think again. The sound of trumpets and drums from army marching bands fills the streets from 7 a.m. This is the annual international military pilgrimage, which traces its roots back to December of 1944, when representatives from militaries across the globe gathered here to celebrate Mass at the Basilica of Our Lady of the Rosary. Then, after World War II came to an end, French soldiers and their chaplains invited German soldiers and their chaplains to gather here to pray. It originated as an attempt to reconcile the nations of Europe that had been at war to allow them to uh, move on to the next stage of their relationship. And actually, uh, at the first uh, military pilgrimage to, to Lourdes, the Germans were afraid to come into the town because they didn't know what the reaction might be. And so, that really began the whole tradition of, of healing and reconciliation. Archbishop Timothy Borolio is the Archbishop for the military services in the USA and is here with a group of pilgrims. If you work with the military, as I've done for the last 14 years, you'll find that the first group that does not want to be at war is the military because they know what it costs. 
And that cost for many who have served in battle is a high price, as they are often left with physical wounds, but also deeper emotional and spiritual wounds. Mom is very proud of me for, you know, just taking the step to leave the house. You know, not only the house, the country, because I'm in a different country now. And I'm just looking for that healing. Judith Benteman is a retired Florida Army National Guard. People come to Lourdes for so many different reasons. And people often say that they're coming here looking for something in Lourdes. They're searching, seeking peace, healing, forgiveness. Or what is it, Judy, that you're here looking for? All of the above. Healing. I suffer from uh, depression and anxiety. I also have PTSD. So healing, prayer, try to meet more people to get out more often. Tasks that may seem simple to you and me, leaving the house, getting on a plane, being in crowds. For Judith, this has been a brave step forward in her life. I'm learning how to adjust and adapt. and Just take one day at a time. Judith is part of a group of 30 former U.S. servicemen and women whose trips here have been sponsored by the Knights of Columbus as part of their Warriors to Lourdes pilgrimage. Charles Galina is a retired colonel with the U.S. Marines and is leading this pilgrimage. What is the purpose of the Warriors to Lourdes pilgrimage? Uh, Lourdes is known throughout the church, the Shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes is known throughout the church as the place of healing. No other population in the U.S. needs healing, peace, reconciliation than our military wounded, ill, and injured, our military that have seen combat. The physical wounds of war are visible. The emotional wounds of war are not so much. Moral injury is totally hidden. It is the wounds to the soul. It's the guilt, the shame of, of what takes place in combat. So how do we heal that? We heal that through prayer, the sacraments, and through ritual. The service men and women who have come here are looking to heal the physical and spiritual wounds of war, and also the wounds from some of life's other unimaginable tragedies. It's hard to share my story because um, I get emotional, yeah. but, um, but when, when when people, uh, especially soldiers, experience tragedy that's very, very significant, you, you kind of, um, you, lose, you lose your faith. Fred Hink is a staff sergeant at the U.S. Army Reserve. For him and his wife, Carly, being here is a chance for them to try and reconnect with their faith after they lost trust in God. For me, I lost my son. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't realize that was the... Yeah. So for, for me, um, it was a, a loss of a, someone close um, that no one should have to go through. And what was your son's name? Uh, Jonathan. Jonathan. Yeah. Jonathan was just 22 when he passed away from a fentanyl overdose and it left his parents feeling completely lost. You need, to, you need to toughen up or, or get over or shake it off. P people are there for a while and then they think, well, now it's about time you should be moving on and getting on with your life. They don't they have yeah, an experience that they can't. It's a, the PTSD and the things that you talk about with soldiers, um, it's so significant and there's such a tragic event. You go into a, you really do go into sort of a state of shock. And to end the weekend, a beautiful candle-lit procession to the Shrine of Our Lady, each flickering light representing someone's hurt, someone's pain, something that only they really know. This is your first time to somewhere like Lourdes? It's amazing. It's, it's truly amazing. And it's, um, I feel like it's a blessing, uh, truly a blessing. Peace and tranquility prayer, uh, they said the rosary over and over and over, and it kind of like bonded to my heart and said, wow, Judy, this is awesome. I lost, I don't know, 
that sense of pain. I had pain, internal pain, and I was like, wow, I feel good. I feel like a different person than when I came out. The great healing for me is to be able to bring the wounded, heal, the injured, their families to the Lord. And so this pilgrimage, this journey, comes to an end for these former servicemen and women here in Lourdes. But really, it is hoped that this will be the beginning of a new journey, a journey within them. The road ahead for many of them will be long, but it is hoped that their time here in Lourdes will leave them with a renewed sense of faith and hope that healing is possible. In Lourdes, France, Colm Flynn for EWTN News In Depth. The Knights of Columbus also offered workshops on moral injury, a mental health issue that is now more widely recognized. Follow our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels to watch Column's exclusive interview with a specialist on moral injury. Coming up, a new beginning for a Ukrainian student at a Catholic high school in suburban Washington. He tells us about his love for music, his new life, and his thoughts of his Ukrainian home. His parents thought he would be safer in the United States than in Ukraine. They took him to the border for his own safety. Now he and his little brother are living in America, living with their grandparents. Reporter Mark Irons has the story of one Ukrainian teenager welcomed at a Catholic high school, finding solace and community in his love of music. Ivan Dmitriev is a percussionist who loves to perform. He's a student who enjoys music class and playing the drums. Ivan dreams of becoming an actor someday. He entertains friends at lunch and fits right in. Life at DeMatha Catholic High School in Hyattsville, Maryland seems to come pretty naturally for Ivan, but he didn't expect it to come like this. I just like watched it in, in movies and dreamed about like being here, you know, studying in American school, but I, I never thought that this dream will come true in this way. A dream born out of a nightmare. It's hard to think about studying other than what's happening in Ukraine. Ivan Dmitriev is a refugee. He was living a normal teenage life in Kyiv until February when Russia invaded his country. He now shares a similar story of survival with millions of other Ukrainians who fled for safety as war unraveled in front of them. Me, my father and little brother walked to the border. Ivan's father, mother and older brother stayed back in Ukraine. In March, Ivan and his little brother arrived in America to live with grandparents in Maryland. In April, Ivan started classes at DeMatha. A frantic few months, but he considers himself lucky. I understand that I have opportunities that other people may not have, and I'm thankful that I have them and I want to use those opportunities. And after enrolling with less than two months before the end of the school year, he took the opportunity to perform. Yep, back to home base, D&G. Most kids take a semester to do this. We've been working on this about a week, so Ivan's a talented dude. Dr. Michael Gaddy, chairman of DeMatha's music department and percussion instructor, says Ivan hasn't missed a beat since arriving. Not just musically, but in general, he's picked up everything so quickly. Whether it's an acclamation to the school or some friendships he's made, he got here thrown into this situation and he seems rather unfazed. After fleeing a desperate situation, Ivan is feeling very welcomed. He's almost 8,000 miles from home, but this Catholic high school community is embracing him like family. It was like so cool because 
the people and teachers, students, they're like so positive. You want to talk with them. As for his family back in Ukraine, Ivan says they are safe. He keeps in regular contact with them. And he believes his home country will ultimately prevail in the fight for freedom. Walking through these school halls with more than a backpack, Ivan carries the weight of being far from home and the uncertainty of his situation. For those who know his story... They must look at Ivan as an example. If this kid left a desperate situation and is so... Uh, his outlook on it all is, is so positive and, and so uh, unaffected, seemingly, uh, everyone around here must think, I, I can learn from this too, and maybe my situation's not as, as, as desperate. For someone who has been through so much, Ivan is focused on performing well in the moment and putting others first. And when uh, I see someone without a smile, I want to make him smile, because that makes me happy and smile too. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. And that's our program for today. I'm Monse Alvarado. Thank you for joining us for this edition of EWTN News In-Depth. And we hope you'll join us again same time next week with more news and reports important to your Catholic life. See you then.